Dr. Nicholas Barton, who has uh, received uh, his uh, BSc honors uh, at the University of London King's College in 1966, and a PhD in rock mechanics uh, in, uh, at the Imperial College in London in 1971 on uh, rock stability. Uh, he's uh, at present uh, the principal at Dick Barton and Associates in Norway, and he has uh, served several uh, positions uh, at NGI Oslo, including a senior international consultant. Uh, he was also associated uh, with uh, Terra uh, Te Tech uh, Incorporated at Salt Lake City in Utah, including being the manager of job mechanics. Uh, he's the recipient of uh, numerous awards, uh, including uh, uh, awards for best papers, uh, uh, the Loris Beer Memorial Lecture in Oslo in 1985, Manuel La Rocha Memorial Lecture in Lisbon in 1987, uh, and uh, Doctor Honoris Causa Honorary Doctor Degree at the University of Cordoba, Argentina in 2004. Uh, his uh, consulting projects uh, have uh, led him all over the world and he's been a consultant on uh, rock engineering problems on the road and rail tunnels, tunnels and caverns for hydropower plants, dams, nuclear waste disposal, rock slope stability and grouting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation to come and give a keynote. Uh, this lecture will be divided into two parts. Maybe the first five to ten minutes will be posing the question, why do we make work so hard for ourselves? Or why do metro owners make, so, make work so hard for themselves by insisting on short escalators, so driving tunnels in saprolite and soil and rock, mixed face, taking two or three times longer than necessary, costing two or three times more than necessary. Why don't we go a little bit deeper and do everything in rock? Uh, this is a sketch from a preliminary design, the preliminary understanding of uh, a new Line 4, which is now nearly completed in Sao Paulo, Brazil. It's only three or four kilometers long, but it's taken many years because of the decision to have short escalators and to go very much with this mixed face problem. So we're looking at just like 20 meters depth here, or 10 or 15 meters depth. Why not make the whole problem a soil mechanics problem or the whole problem a rock mechanics problem? Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some extreme overbreak in a, in a tunnel, in a, a cavern, excuse me, a station cavern here where one end is in rock and one end completely in soil. Uh, this is where my wife lives and me some of the year as well. And uh, big settlement problems in many, many places like this. So many, many houses damaged because of the difficulty of controlling groundwater by being too high in the, pro in the profile. But most of the lecture will be about this special case record, a tragic collapse of one of the stations. So. These were some of the cores that were available about uh, six, seven years ago, before the project started. And uh, several of us wrote reports recommending to uh, avoid making the whole metro in, in this area. This, you can see here, 11, 12, 13, 17, 27, 30 meters. So why construct the project in this area where you can go into reasonable jointed gneiss and, uh, and granite that's better than this also. Um, just to save escalator length, spend twice as long, three times the cost or more, yeah? So this is just to indicate the driving by top heading and 10 meter a week was a, a reasonable rate. I mean, sometimes it was slower than that. This is extremely slow tunneling. Why, why give yourself such problems because of this mixed face? And then there was the, the benching and the final lining. So a slow project, yeah, and a, an expensive project. Uh, if one did everything from underground, this is from another part of the world, but fiber reinforced shot creep rock bolts following uh, systematic pre-injection with water control. 
you can go have a completed tunnel at 20 meters a week. Everything is done. Right? This is uh, the station where they had this big overbreak. Um, we look into this entrance here. This is some curtains to limit the effect of the blasting. So one of the station cabins is being developed here in this direction and one in this direction. So in this direction, it looks like this, the top heading. In the direction behind us, it was just purely in soil and big deformation and nearly loss of control. Here you see that the soil and the sand and the soil and the satellite has been removed. This is sort of a, a rock surface, basically. And this huge overbreak has nearly come into the surface. In retrospect, one could have pre-bolted that arch, of course. <coughs> Uh, this is the overbreak when the station cavern is fully developed. So I think uh, the scale of this man, if you put two meters here, this is about five meters of overbreak, something like that. So on the other side, was completely in soil. And this is one of the running tunnels going between these two station caverns with another huge overbreak. Fortunately, nobody was injured here, but it's almost going up into the into the the top is satellite, basically. And there was a breakthrough at another part of the line due to a sort of a long block, not really a wedge, but a block coming through with weathered sides where the radial bolting and shot creeps didn't manage to prevent the shearing failure. So the people were tipped out of bed in the middle of the night. <coughs> And uh, now to the Pineros station tragedy. Unfortunately, this saint didn't quite do the work that was expected. So it was a tragedy. Uh, the picture well before construction time is here. There's a highway here, two highways here, and twin rail, a, a noisy site, one could say. And uh, the investigating institute tried to use seismic refraction along this project 10 years before, and uh, they didn't manage to get any results. Around this cavern, there were 11 boreholes, and, and, and really close by, there were six boreholes, and one of them right in the center of the cavern. What was expected on average? Averaging these five nearest boreholes, the uh, rock cover was this much, about three meters. So an original plan to use uh, bolting and shot creep was rejected, and uh, heavy lattice girders and about 40 centimeters of fiber reinforced shot creep was, was designed as the temporary support with elephant feet in this position here, and then benching down in two stages. So. The, the core, the central borehole drilled right on the axis of the cavern, looked like this, about 17, 18 meters of these small containers containing sand, soil, and saprolites, and then into the, the foliated gneiss. It's not easy to realize that there's any vertical foliation, but in fact, on average, the foliation was vertical. It's easy to see at the end after excavating through all the fallen material, but it's certainly not easy to see on these pictures. And uh, the two other close boreholes, just at the portal, so to speak, of where this cavern starts, around the shaft, again, it's not easy to see that there's a typical vertical foliation. And uh, the picture is similar, about uh, 45 meters of rock cover in this area, a little bit less some places, but averaging three meters. So this central borehole, was the same average rock, showing the same average rock cover as the five nearest boreholes. Uh, this is a picture taken when the top heading had been completed. And I regret that we're going to see the collapse of all this area. And this is a road called Rua Capri, where there, were, there was a pedestrian and also a minibus, and they were sucked to their death, to a very deep level. They didn't just sort of fall with the sand and the soil, they were sucked 
to a deep level and it was 12 days before they, they were recovered. Um, so maybe you'll see the reason that there was a sort of a, an air blast effect and a suction effect, so a piston effect that you'd normally think walking along a pavement that you could avoid cracking suddenly occurring in front of you, but they, they were taken so suddenly. Uh, during excavation through the fallen material that you'll see photographs of a little bit later, this is a sort of typical structure. And uh, this is one of the joints with crossing the cavern at right angles with a, with a certain dip, about 75, 80 degrees, and some horizontal jointing. And the foliation somewhat variable. You don't really see the distinct foliation jointing, but it, it's in there in, in slightly different orientation. Uh, the Q logging that had been done by the investigating institute 10 years before, showing a typical value of about 1 and going down to 0.1 and going up to about 4 or 5. And uh, I used, after the collapse, I was called in to give an independent opinion of what may have been the cause. So I used the Q histogram method of, of logging. And, uh, I logged, and you'll see on the next slide, I logged the, the top six to eight meters of these six nearest holes, seven nearest holes, and you'll see the result for five of the holes here. This is just recording RQD, JN, JR, JA, etc. And coming up with the statistics, so the Q mean 0.6, most frequent 0.2 and the range about 0.1 to 4. So very similar to what was predicted from a smaller number of boreholes by the investigating institute 10 years before. The reality of the subsurface, and this looks to be impossible because there was a central borehole, is something very crudely looking like this, with an extraordinary ridge <coughs> above the cavern. And uh, you can already imagine as rock mechanics engineers that if this broke through the support, you have a sort of a, a wedge loading from something like this. And it, it was not discovered by a central borehole, and the presumed reason is, is that, that we, we could see during the excavation through all this fallen material that there was a low spot, and then by chance it gave the average three meters of rock cover, which is one of the principal unfortunate aspects of this case, that, that there are many more and all joined together, they, they cause a huge accident similar to these uh, dramatic plane accidents where there's four or five factors all, all coming together. You could predict each one separately, but that they should all occur together in the same place in the same time is very unlikely. Another unfortunate aspect is the it was originally thought to be a fault, but it's actually a planar, you'll see pictures later, a very, very planar discontinuity. And all this part of the cavern fell and broke the shaft because of a sort of a downslope and forward component by sliding on the surface. Beyond here, there was no collapse. So roughly speaking, this soil and saprolite here and the rock that was up here it all fell down about 9 or 10 meters to the floor of the cavern, which had reached the first uh, bench stage. And because of the, uh, the component in that direction, half of the shaft also collapsed. So you have this very sad picture, um, and then huge rescue operations, trying to find the poor people who were driving along this road in a minibus. They didn't even know how many people had been in the minibus, and they didn't know how many people walking along the road. So the axis of the cavern that's collapsed is here. This is the eastern cavern, and the western cavern is this direction going nearly under the adjacent river. Uh, and a picture from a different direction. This is this road where these people died, and this is this discontinuity at the end of the collapse. So following the collapse, in which these eventually it was discovered seven people lost their lives, there was a police-supervised excavation through all the fallen soil, 
satellite rock and crush cavern supports, a, a rather unique occurrence, I suppose, where they were trying to discover if the contractor, the designer, were culpable of a poor design, what was the reason for the collapse. So this is the result of, after excavating about 40,000 cubic meters of material, we're looking at this tieback excavation. And uh, now it's quite clear that, at least at the, at the floor of the cavern level, that you have a subvertical foliation. You have some details that were not picked up by the, the boreholes. Remember, one of the central boreholes was in this position. There's a little bit of clay here. There's some details that you don't pick up, but usually classification methods, RMR, was used as a basic method of collecting information. <coughs> Normally, those variations are taken care of. Now, this is what it looked like at the bottom. So this is a, an interesting detail. A boudinage completely weathered to very, very low friction clay. Maybe this occurred somewhere here. Maybe it affected a local mechanism of, of wall collapse that you'll see the result of in a moment. So RMR logging was performed by the company hired by the contractor consortium. They were familiar with RMR, not with Q, so RMR was used. And uh, this is a typical cavern face record. They were going ahead uh, about 85 centimeter, installing each lattice girder and shot creating. So the geologists didn't have much more than the, the face to observe. There's a, there's a description here of all the RMR parameters for the lower quality on either side and a better quality sort of core. Some of you may already be seeing a slight possibility of a, of a, of a wedge surface, but the geologist insisted there was no discontinuity here at that level. Yeah? What happens above is another question. And his knowledge was that the, the rock on average was three meters above. So it didn't arouse suspicion. Here he described uh, the presence of clay on the main joint sets and also on secondary joint sets. So the, the general poor quality of the rock was well understood. Uh, this is some of the early appearance. You can't really see any special sort of better quality core at this place. Uh, later on, these are some of the recordings of the, how the face looked. We're approaching a larger volume of good quality rock, and we're coming closer to this road, Rua Capri. This, I think, is under Rua Capri. And in fact, this improved volume of, this larger volume of improved rock, it resulted in uh, pre-injection screens. There were three pre-injection screens every 10 meters. The fourth one was not done because the grab tape was getting less and less. Uh, you see two of the pictures again. And uh, specifically, you see the quality on the A side was about 35, 36 in RMR, and the central core material about 44, repeated quite often 44, 45. <coughs> so again, logged with the assumption of a, a rock cover of two to three to four meters on average. Here you see these pre-injection screens. Uh, this is a simple-minded string model that I put together just a few weeks after the collapse, putting some of these sections together in their relative position <coughs> to this road and to this discontinuity that we thought was the fault at that time. Uh, there are a lot of equations relating Q and RMR. Um, I've just used two of them here, the, the classic one that's in Bianowski's book that most people use with... Uh, log to the base E, Q, times 9, plus 44, and one that I've proposed, 15 log Q, log to base 10 Q, plus 50, which uh, prevents RMR going into negative territory and kind of spreads across to 95 and 5. It, it may not be correct. Maybe RMR should go negative, but it's impossible to use in this extreme bad rock, but I prefer this one because it's easier to remember. So we're going to look at the conversion of the, the face logging of RMR to possible Q value on this Q support diagram. So 
using those two possible equations, the, uh, the logs RMR of the, the surrounding material and the RMR of the central better quality material, it either comes down in here using the one equation or it comes down from this position using the other equation. In all events, it's within this range that was Q logged. And I will mention that if the very heavy support measure in the Q system, the RRS, rib rim for shotcrete, where the whole rib is bolted, it's much stronger than lattice girder and steel arches. I think that also would have failed if one had been very conservative and just designed on the very worst 10, 15% of core conditions. So all these systems would have failed, I'm sure. Uh, 10 years before this investigating institute, they had not succeeded in refraction seismic to get any velocities because of the noise and the difficult terrain, but they did succeed in doing some cross-hole seismic, not tomography, just average velocities between three holes. It's in a site where they were doing a cross-hole hydrotomography, picking up the three-dimensional permeability between seven holes. So you see this uh, classic picture of the very low velocities in the satellite, and then a sudden increase in velocity climbing into the weathered drop, rock and the jointed rock and the more sound rock. So there's a a very, very steep gradient of, of velocity there, about 200 second to the minus one if you express kilometer per second per, per kilometer. So actually there's a, a good conversion between the Q value logs and these uh, velocities you'll see on the next slide. So the, the Q logging that was done independently, it, it sort of fits this model quite well and this is also fairly consistent, the top of rock, 15, 16, 17, 18 meters, and it's at the western cavern, it's near the, near the river. So all these measurements, they were showing consistency. Um, so this cross-hole seismic measurements between 2.5 and a 4.2 kilometers a second, we bring them across to the shallow diagram here, 25 meter nominal depth, and you come down to the, the same as the logged Q value. So no, no surprises here. Uh, so because of the expected low rock cover, the rock bolts and shotcrete was rejected, and uh, heavy lattice girder with the elephant feet. It doesn't look very heavy here, but when you see close up, it's, it's quite significant. And sprayed in with between 35 and 45 centimeter in practice of fiber reinforced shotcrete of good quality. And this is the appearance. Uh, here they've reached just before the running tunnel will start. So they are doing a pre-injection here. They didn't do a pre-injection of this last section. But this very last section didn't fail either. It failed from about this position backwards towards us. This is some of the early spraying in where the quality was reasonable near the shaft walls. Uh, concerning deformation measurement, there was a lot of deformation measurements here. There were various episodes of, of rapidly accelerating deformation and then more horizontal periods. Of course, a change going from the top head into the first bench. The second bench hadn't been reached. After the recess, the Christmas recess, there were some small movements again, similar to some of these other ones. No one was alarmed until suddenly in the last three days there were emergency meetings and people got concerned. We've, we've learned afterwards, yeah. So, to try to explain what happened, I borrowed one of the seismic refraction profiles exactly as reproduced by this institute but about three or four hundred meters away in a, in, a, in a somewhat quieter part of the side streets near one of the other stations. And they've written here a sand, rock, or boulder, and weathered rock, and satellite or soil, without velocities. So I've sort of converted this picture into the one down here. I put some houses on the top, this Rua Capri. Maybe there was some sort of boulder. I mean, eventually this boulder was discovered, but this drawing was done before the boulder was discovered, because I was suspicious about this core of good material like this. 
this is just a sketch that I've done to try to match what is drawn here. And uh, there's a sort of a morphological development, of course, of, of we could call it core stone, but it's something that actually went for about 70 or 80 meters, this ridge of material it was traced later in photographs of the running tunnel. It even went slightly around the curve by some miracle. So uh, initially we could have something like this, maybe joints defining these boundaries, low roughness, GRC 1 to 2, JR 1.5, thousands of years of water, erosion, weathering, becomes something like this maybe, and then eventually something like this. And uh, when a cavern is taken below this unknown feature, obviously there's a, there's a big threat. So I borrowed, you'll see the, the source of this sketch in a moment. The dotted lines on the edges is to represent sort of extra weathering. And this is one of the pictures of this fallen ridge of rock that fell. You'll see more in a moment. So this was very, very weathered rock. You could sort of with a geological hammer, you could make maybe two centimeter, one to two centimeter hole in it very easily, but it gets stronger as you go in. So this is sort of the residue of this class three RMR that is at the top. So here it's, of course, more like class four, because it's weathered, but lower down it was class three. But class three that was logged in the cavern, class four at the sides. And the class four at the sides obviously become saprolite and, and, and soil in a, in a more rapid manner than this central core. Uh, just to mention, this is a picture of saprolite from somewhere else. The, rel the relic structures that you get in gneiss and granite <coughs> would also be a source of, of loading, adding to this load, which was eventually calculated between 15,000 and 20,000 ton ridge sitting on the rock support. <coughs> uh, this is the sketch from a paper by Linton that I discovered in one of Fuchs and Franklin's papers of some many years later. So maybe under the surface, this was the sort of phenomena. There was this ridge like this. This is in granite. It's more massive than you get in gneiss. And this central borehole, late 704, that hit a low spot because of extra jointing, it's sort of hit in this area, yeah? <clears throat> so this is the original drawings from Linton's very nice article, where with the heavy jointing, you get a more rapid development of soil and satellite. And in the southwest of England, in Dartmoor, you get these Taurus, T-O-R-S, that look like this. In Sao Paulo, you can say that the same phenomena is still with the soil and the satellite in place. So other pictures of the same thing. And there's a tendency, because of the weathering, of inclined sides. And unfortunately, this is very important for this wedge-type loading. And, and, and a sudden lack of shear strength when deformation occurs. So in summary, these... Uh, they assumed the real, how could this be? Because the central borehole misses this ridge and uh, the central borehole symbolically in, in, in this area. Yeah? So post-collapse excavation supervised actually now by the same team who did this investigation 10 years before. They were supervised, supervising or doing the excavation, supervising the excavation with the police also there took about 15 months of careful excavation to go through this material. And the following will mostly be uh, pictures. So this is uh, one of the stages of, of, of cutting down and beginning to tie back the, the walls because they're going to go right to the bottom here. This is when this ridge, one of the stages when this ridge is discovered. You'll see some pictures from the side in a moment. And one of the pictures you've already seen from the edge this rather smooth surface that I said you could hit. And all, all this ridge has fallen 10 meters. It's difficult to believe this, but it's fallen 10 meters. So on either side, the, the rock is sort of in place on either side. And, and, and all the material in the center here 
has fallen 10 meters, so now you only see soil sand and some residue of, of saprolite. And continuously they're making roadways for the excavators, so you, you have to be there frequently to, to pick up pictures like this. And uh, this is one of the, maybe the more massive looking, it's quite weak weather drop, but it's, it's still a load of 2.2, 2.3, 2.4 density contributing to the load, and the, the, the top surface here is about, uh, I mean, it, it, it's showing that the top elevation here was 10 or 11 meters above what was assumed for the rock level. So even after it's fallen 10 meters, it's still several meters above the original cavern arch. This is this weak material, as you've seen, a little bit close up. And longitudinally, of course, you don't have the impressive granite tour type structures in, in Gneiss, but it's still a load, a very big load, and, but with this very systematic jointing across. So these, these have fallen, these long ridges, they've fallen 10 meters, and this is their appearance from the side. And some indicate that the running tunnel was somewhere under here, so there's some indication of the, the sand the rather white sand and the soil that's been sort of sucked downwards in this area. <coughs> because above the rock here, the, the sand and the soil is above here, but here it's been sucked into the tunnel entrance. And uh, afterwards, this is one of several photographs in the running tunnel where a ridge of better rock could be seen. So this ridge is going from here and it's following around even Following this curve, if you can believe, it sounds like a, a tall story, but it's true that this ridge followed the cavern and the, and the running tunnel. So some of the collapsed material with the, the pre-injection tubes. Now it looks very sad, this lattice girder just bent. The shot creature has been broken, of course. We're nearly at the floor that you've seen cleaned earlier on. And uh, in this area where there was a little local, these boudinage of clay, the, just in this area, there was this type of mechanism where the wall failed. And maybe this is a fracturing of the, of the rock underneath the elephant foot that was in this place here. So you'll see very briefly at the end some numerical modeling where this possible fracturing may have occurred under the very heavy loads of the elephant feet. A crushed excavator with some plastic material in the arm here. I don't know what this is, whether it's rock or shotcrete, but it's certainly plastic behavior, if ever there was plastic behavior. It's, it's impossible to see what it was. It's sort of caught in the arm with 20,000 ton load on this, on this excavator distributed. So here, you're actually seeing the lattice girders and the shotcrete and the, crash, the crushed uh, shot creeps. And then we're seeing the wall, which in some way, fortunately, was mesh reinforced, so we can see the difference. And then again above, we're seeing lattice girder. So sort of a three-way sandwich is discovered in various places in the floor. So you'll see sketches of this in just a moment. So here, this was some of the failure of this wall, where there was maybe fracturing under the elephant feet. And this is another location. The, the dark is the wall, shot treat with mesh. The rest is fiber reinforced with the lattice girder. And here you can see the explanation. I just showed you a picture of this area here where there was lattice girder, mesh, a lattice girder in a sandwich by this presumably development of plastic hinges higher up here. And the composite of all the observations, this is by this institute IPT. So uh, briefly, some summary of the numerical methods and just a few minutes from the end now. Uh, I utilized the expertise of Batang Shen, who developed FRACOD, boundary element code for fracture initiation, and also Savras Bandis for doing UDEF studies. So a very, very brief look pictorially at, at, at some of the things they did. 
So here you see the sort of the, the, the style of, of stress fracturing in the rock. If the load from this lattice gird uh, elephant foot is too high, this is if there's some simple jointing. So a whole series of models were done with uh, three stages of, it, of increasing compression strength, increasing modulus, and increasing load going in this direction. This is the, the maximum load and the minimum strength. As you imagine, this is the minimum load and the maximum strength and modulus. So the truth was perhaps somewhere in, in, in this area here. You see the loading levels here in megapascal, 2.5, 6, and 12 megapascal from this load of the elephant foot. And three UCS assumptions, 5, 10, and 16 megapascal for the weathered rock, and moduli 2.5, 5, and 8 GTA. Uh, the UDEX study, the first model with a wedge representing the better quality rock, it did not fail, actually. There was too much development of, of shear on the edges. So, And this modeling was done before full excavation through the material. We were not aware of the, 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 the strong rounding of this area. So eventually, a wedge of clay was put in this surrounding the, the core. And this model indeed failed. First of all, with no support, just to show a mechanism. Uh, doesn't need any further comments, I think. Something that's very fast, and uh, maybe with a road here of asphalt and soil, suddenly you, you get a temporary arch, and there's an air blast, a suction behind this block that has fallen. Incidentally, a, 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 a tunnel worker who was running about 200 meters away in one of the running tunnels, he was blown over while he was running, blown over by the air blast when, when this fell. Uh, this is the top heading. Uh, there's very heavy loads on the lattice girder. There is a lattice girder in here. It's not shown in this diagram. And uh, now it's showing the moment and the normal forces in the, in the, fiber, in the combined fiber reinforced shot creed and lattice girder, and uh, very heavy moments in this area. So these elements locally were exceeding the combined strength of the reinforced shot creed. So because they passed beyond the combined strength in an NM, a normal force moment diagram, these, these elements were softened, and then the final failure occurred like this, the predicted failure. Yeah? and even lack of contact eventually, of course. This happens very fast in the real world. In the numerical world, it's a very complicated modeling affair that goes more slowly. So finally, the assumed triggering mechanism, water and water pressure from a cracked pipe. You'll see in a moment the diagram. This is a, a, another additional adverse feature of this, what caused this tragedy. An exceptionally heavy rain in terms of the, the, the highest for two or three years, about three to three or four weeks before, but not in the week immediately re preceding the failure. So this discontinuity, the rear discontinuity, we'll see that in a moment a bit closer. You'll see how smooth and planar it is if you don't see already. And this pipe that's been cut off here, it was hanging down and there was water coming out of this pipe. It's 600 millimeter scale here, a little bit further away. I think this is, you can see this uh, manhole here. Just the other side of this manhole, it's one meter size. So this is the very smooth, plain appearance of this discontinuity. To this side, it failed, and to the other side, it didn't fail. So extremely low JRC and JR. So symbolically, making a sort of a longitudinal version of Linton's concept, uh, where the low point was here, symbolically, the low point that said this three meters of rock cover that ignored and never saw all this. So the tube changing from one meter diameter to 70 mil 700 millimeter, that's a sort of 50% reduction in cross-section. Maybe when it's running full, that would represent a high, a high pressure in the pipe and maybe penetration into this discontinuity, maybe even along the the walls of, of this beginning to deform wedge. So 
picture of the actual dimensions here, this discontinuity. And uh, just by chance, this discontinuity is also exactly in the same direction as the maximum permeability that was measured by 3D hydrotomography. It's another feature of the adverse. So, summary of the problems. This unique elevated seismic ridge, excuse me, following the cavern and tunnel axis. Deceiving top of rock information from the five nearest boreholes, and especially deceiving top of rock information from the central borehole where the ridge was not seen at all. And in fact, uh, during the mapping, there was an indication of opposed foliation. So there was foliation in opposed directions for the material that had fallen. And the geologists insist that this was not affected by, by this central core. But there was an adverse feature in the foliation that was picked up. And the polarity of potential joint failure planes crossing the cavern, so it could be stepped failure at each end. And this rear discontinuity plane cracking a water pipe, reduction to half cross section at the same location. So I've said that it's unpredictable in the circumstances, an unpredictable in the circumstances accident. The recommendations are obvious, just two of them. Deeper construction from the underground, as practice of necessity in many cities. I mean, Moscow, Prague, London. You have deep excavators. You even have vertical lift shafts to get down to a suitable geology. It's a cheaper and safer solution and would also result in less settlement damage. Because rock conditions, as we all know, they're much more favorable at depth. And near the surface, it's more unpredictable because of differential weathering in typical tropical climates at least. So that was the end. Thank you.